I'm so excited to be in Pasadena, California at one of the coolest hobby shops anywhere, the original Whistle Stop. Let's go check it out. Hey Dan, Fred. welcome to the West Coast and welcome to the Monday Morning Express. Welcome to Monday Morning Express. As promised, today we are going to take you to the original Whistle Stop in Pasadena, California. We're gonna let you look around and we're gonna enjoy chatting with Fred Hill a little bit. Yeah, looking forward to that, Dan. And also we're in part four of our segments with Mr. Boyd Reyes. We're gonna see about uh, decaling and striping a brass model train. Striping, not stripping. You stripping was a couple uh, times ago. Anyways, it's all important. Hey, behind me, you're gonna see some uh, neat footage. We're gonna go visit Chuck Ward in Southern California. You're gonna see his great layout. And then also we're gonna see his beautiful brass collection. And then shortly after that, we have a surprising uh, bit of news for you that you're not gonna wanna miss. And hey, Dan, before we get any further, uh, what's up with the digs? Oh, hey, I'm getting in the spirit for the Brass Expo coming up in November 3rd and 4th in Chicago. And uh, I'm excited for it. Yeah, well, since you brought it up, tell us a little bit about what we can expect at the Expo this year. Well, we got some great news. We have just confirmed we're going to have a beautiful presentation with Mr. Kenichi Matsumoto, and he's going to team up with Fred Hill. Now, Kenichi comes uh, from Japan, and he is one of the true experts of early Japanese brass. It's fascinating, you're gonna love his stories and his photos, and he can even tell these early hand-builts and so forth who built them by certain characteristics. And he'll explain to you about that, you're gonna love it. Absolutely, and of course a perfect follow-up to that will be a presentation by Mr. Jeff Lemke. It uh, does some beautiful weathering, and this is one organized guy. I can't wait to be able to show some of his stuff and techniques. Yeah, and it's a great follow-up because Jeff worked with Tom Marsh primarily at Overland for years. And, and Jeff was smart. He took some amazing photographs, the best I've ever seen of that era of brass trains. So he's going to tell you what went on behind the scenes to get those brass trains and those green boxes that we all love to see. It's going to be a spectacular one-two punch. I really think it's going to be worth the trip and the price of admission just for those two back-to-back -back, uh, presentations. And of course, uh, something that we're gonna show that's a little new is this year's some clinics that we have to look forward to. Yeah, so tell us about some of the clinics. Well, we got uh, Mr. Boyd Reyes, uh, he's gonna be there. We've seen him on our uh, episodes here on the Monday Morning Express, and he just does such a great job in painting and, and other aspects. We thought it would be good to have him there uh, teaching some of the techniques and taking questions from you uh, in the audience. So go ahead and come to the show. You're able to get a little interaction with Boyd, and which he's a really cool guy. Yeah, he's fun. You're gonna love talking to him. He'll answer your questions. He's really open about any ways to help you out. Now we're gonna have more clinics. Jimmy Booth uh, is going to be handling some tips on soldering. You mm -hmm. won't wanna miss that. We're hoping, depending on his health, Bill Peter will be able to join as well. Bill is the master solderer. They say he can solder a bolt to a Coke bottle. <laughs> so he is uh, gonna show you some tips and tricks you did not think are possible on repairing a brass engine. Yeah, and you know, Bill's fingertips. Uh, I've done some soldering myself, and I don't think he has any <laughs> feeling whatsoever, but very, very interesting to, to see his techniques that he's gonna use there. Also, we're gonna keep you up to date with some more news uh, throughout the show, but for now, let's get to uh, that layout in Southern California we talked about with Mr. Chuck Ward. On this road trip so far, we have seen some beautiful layouts. We've seen some phenomenal collections. And here with Chuck in California, we have both. One of the most amazing collections I have ever seen, Chuck, of brass uh, lining these walls. And then this layout is just fabulous. So tell us a little bit about uh, when you started work on the layout and what your goals were with it. Mainly we started in 09 and trying to lay out the room and already had the showcases up. I had to cover those up and started in with the framework and the, put all steel in and uh, went from there and then started cutting stuff and making room for rivers and 
things of that nature and trying to figure out what levels and where we want to be and how high and and figured out the mountains. That's the only thing in the background. We started uh, with that and we wanted to bring them up high and put in some nice scenery and a lot of trees and stuff that uh, just normally not there. Yeah, and that's what's spectacular. Not only is it big, it's a double decker, but both uh, really have phenomenal level of detailing throughout. And like the more you look at it, you just get drawn into the scene. So it has to feel real good to kind of look at it and watch your trains run around. Yes, and then getting getting to that point, and I still got a lot of stuff to do, and then put siding here, and put the Give plexiglass kind of up. Look. Yeah, yeah, get but... it uh, all all stained wood. So and you're using DCC, right? Yes, that's it. And uh, we got different sections and uh, all the uh, reverse loops in, stuff like that, uh, that's gonna make a difference in running and how much you can run and, you know, and we started in and started adding stuff and then put in some sightings and it was just kind of out of the hat, you know? Yeah. And uh, that that's what's uh, good about it. And then trying to get as much radius as you can because of what you want to run. What is your radius on it? It's, it's anywhere from 50 down to about 34. It's you know? definitely big enough to run some nice passenger that, trains through That here. was the whole thing. It, it, uh, that was what intrigued the whole issue was to put in a good station and have sightings and stuff and put in the uh, not real long uh, passenger trains because the, the layout's not huge, but uh, good good enough size that it, you know, you got the uh, the look. So it, it does work out pretty nice. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, stuff that took a long time to do, like the roundhouse and I had a person work on that, and then the, a lot of the trees uh, were handmade, and that took uh, many months for one guy, and then I had another guy working on stuff, and we had a lot of uh, different types and stuff uh, to use, and you know, they're, they're in there, and it all shows that uh, you get the variety, it's just not one, one thing. And uh, as far as the lighting, we still have a little bit more to go, and then uh, getting in more signals, which is going to be good, and all that uh, hooked up, ready to roll. And another neat feature, speaking of lighting, not only all the lighting on the layout, but you have a lighting system in the room that will actually go into a twilight, correct? Yes. Well, we can shut all the shutters and then turn off the up above lights and then turn on the blue lights, and then we have blue lights underneath in rope fashion on the second level and uh, then everything looks nice and all your passengers and your locomotives and everything's kind of in a dusk scene. Yeah, that's... Which, which is nice and it, it gives you that effect and you can do different things and all the buildings are lit and the signal systems are moving and, and uh, just, you know, got to straighten things up and clean things up and get, uh, get a few more things done. It'll be a little bit longer. And then, well, it's excellent work. Now, I know you said it's not huge, but trust me, it's huge. <laughs> it just when it's your layout, you always want a little more, right? Oh, yeah. See, that was the thing. You wanted to bust the room out and, you know, you want a 40 by 70 or 80 and, <laughs> and you got everything to put down on it and, you know, make it make it run. I got showcases of buildings left over and all kinds of stuff that, uh, you know, it just didn't fit or wasn't going to move and you do what you can with what you got and put it in or take it out and put something else in and, you know, make it look uh, realistic. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Now, what got you into trains? Well, I used to <laughs> live around trains for a long time, SP, and uh, used to watch the cab forwards and the daylights run up and down the coast and in around Bakersfield and, and uh, Tehachapi and you know, even Mojave back out that way and watch the Santa Fe stuff run. And uh, it uh, all up and down through uh, Palmdale, Lancaster, and, and you know, used to hang out up at the loop sometimes and, we, we, you know, go there as you're, when you're little and have lunch and just watch everything. Yeah, you never forget it, obviously. Nope. Now, uh, as far as the brass collection, when did you start getting into brass, and what do you like about brass model trains? Well, basically, uh, I got into that 
when I changed scales, I was into Lionel and got rid of uh, that stuff and then started in with something that was reasonably small enough, but yet you could, you know, handle it and it does look real and you don't have to have a lot of room. You right, know, so that's why you zeroed in kind of on HO scale as your primary yes, scale. Yes, and then they had more more to offer. Right. Yeah, and a lot better, a lot better stuff, and uh, it's it's in, improved over the last 30, 40 years a lot. Yeah, and it's amazing how good it is today, isn't it? Yes, and what I started out with was, <laughs> uh, you know, you start out with Balboa or Westside, and right? Then then you look around at Akani and you know, some of those and you, you start moving forward and then there's better stuff out there with more detail and it, it just keeps coming. So that that's what started it and you just started uh, from there and I had a lot of brass passenger cars before I even had my first uh, freight, freight car. Okay. Because they everything was kits. So then when KD started coming out, the, I said, well, hey, this stuff's done. I don't have to build a sunshine kit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you bought the brass for the passenger and then... And then just, just went from there. Whatever it took to build your empire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and, you know, display it where right. you can see it and enjoy yeah, it's it. it's a beautiful display. But now, you have all these consists. Did you work on putting those together, you know, to make sure the right cars are with the right motor Basically, power? tried to get everything in order, and then I've had some help through people that... Uh, you know, that knew the contest and right. you know, I just started putting stuff up because I had it and pulling stuff out of boxes. And uh, then it's all been covered since 09 when we started working on the framework because I didn't want to damage anything or have all the dust on the doggone uh, covers. And we just opened open that up in the last few days. Well, we got here at just the right time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you for uncovering it for us. It was, uh, it's like uncovering a masterpiece, unveiling the masterpiece. Yeah, when, cause, yeah. Yeah, because it is beautiful if for I sure. Had, if I had more walls, I'd have more up. <laughs> yeah. That's a good message to our viewers. If you have more walls, you need more brass trains. <laughs> That's true. Then you have the display up where you want to see it. You don't want it in boxes. Right. You got a closet full of futures. Yeah. And it, what are you going to do with it? And, and all of a sudden, you find something that you didn't know you had. Yeah, that's that's I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's a good problem, but well, hey Chuck, thanks so much for your hospitality, inviting us to your home uh, to see this spectacular layout and phenomenal brass train collection. Congratulations! Well, thank you. Hi, my name is Juan Zaloga. I'm a brass collector, modeler, and painter, and you're watching Monday Morning Express. Well, we promised you a special announcement, and here is the breaking news. Uh, no doubt you were fascinated to see the video uh, of the collection with Chuck Ward, uh, the beautiful structures he has on his layout and all those trains on the wall. And uh, we have actually purchased, uh, yeah. Le Roland, last week. Tell them about what we went through to get that collection back here in Florida. Yeah, some long hours, and uh, certainly my back's still hurt, and I know yours is too, and the team that we were able to bring there, but... Uh, that's what we've been showing uh, over our screen here, some of the just incredible pieces that Chuck had on his layout. Yeah, we uh, told Chuck, and we're excited, we're going to use a lot of these in our own layout, so, so that's neat. But we also, uh, we just have a tremendous amount of beautiful, late-run brass models. Take a little sneak peek right now at what's going to be posted on the site starting today.
right, so that's a pretty cool collection that we just received in here at our warehouse. Uh, took a lot of work getting it into the building, Dan, so, but something we certainly appreciated. And just to mention a little bit about Chuck Ward out there in California, certainly uh, appreciate uh, his time in collecting this and amassing this uh, uh, layout, this collection that we were able to receive, and we certainly uh, appreciated all of his hard work and, and also uh, having us there into their home. Yeah, him and his wife, Linda, were very hospitable. We appreciate that. And Chuck, man, he hung with us. We were working from 8 in the morning till midnight a few of them nights, and he mm -hmm. was going up and down them stairs with us. We appreciate it. And real quick, guys, like maybe in that little video you spotted something, we'll get it listed as quick as we can. We have to inspect everything. We clean it. We photograph it. We have a process to go through. But keep watching the site. It's going to take a number of months to get all that listed. Yeah, very cool. And, you know, someone out there helping us was uh, Mr. Boyd Reyes. He's a good friend of uh, Chuck's, and uh, we certainly appreciate his help, along with Juan Zalaga. Uh, they helped us out there. But speaking of Boyd, uh, that's going to segue now into our next segment, which is segment number four with him, as far as now how to decal and stripe a brass model trainer. Now we're to, well, my favorite part, it begins here, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure yours yeah. too, right? This, <laughs> that depends on how many you do, <laughs> yeah. I guess. <laughs> how many you do, it's like, oh, excellent. Yeah, taping. I was like, yeah, oh, nice. yeah, right? <laughs> okay, so here, what we're just gonna show briefly is the different stages, okay, that we're you know, looking to achieve here. Obviously, this is the, the final product yes. uh, that we're looking to, uh, to take care of here, but we see with our final product, We've got some, some fine lines in here. We've got our orange in here, some more striping in there. So we're gonna see how you go about uh, doing all of this, all right? Yeah. So tell us what's going on here. We know our unpainted here. We're clean, ready to go. What's the next step? Well, the first thing, after you strip a model, the brass, there's gonna be different shades mm -hmm. on and we the see brass. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. So to even, for scale coat, I use Maintenance Away Gray, number 20. Mm -hmm. I spray that to even out the, the, the body color. Um, because if, if I were to use white, white is so opaque when you spray it on there, it's gonna have, you're gonna require a lot of coats. And I found out that the Maintenance Away Gray, I better place big orders of it because everybody's gonna suck it down, that this works really good at evening out my colors. It's like if you, if you had a, a color chart our Pantone color chart. They print it up on a very light background mm -hmm. and all the colors are based on that light background. And that's the way I feel about this is I put a light background and every time I put my colors, my co colors from one model to the next, it's always gonna come out the same shade. Right, right. And so I don't have to worry about, you know, that, oh my God, there's a brass discoloration underneath that that's changed the pitch of the paint. So that base coat, is very important. It's an integral part of it. Yes. It helps with the actual layers of paint that you're gonna put on top of yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. It's very thin when you apply it. It doesn't take that much to really cover. It covers great. I love that, that maintenance away gray. Versus if I shot with the white or other colors that, I don't know why it is that some colors react differently, but I found that that, that light gray, maintenance away gray, works great. Okay, As excellent. A base. All right, so we go on to the next step then. The next step is I would paint the entire model yellow. Uh, okay. Yellow is for the stripes. I always start off my models doing the lightest colors. You gotta lightest. work from the lightest, okay. work out to the darkest. So I would spray the yellow, and after spraying, wait, th this is, these are day processes. One day is strippy, the next day I shoot maintenance away gray, sits in the oven, mm -hmm. the next day, you never want to tape in the same, same day. day. You, mm -hmm. Your paint can actually stick onto the tape and it won't release the tape. So yeah. best rule of thumb, be patient, tape the next day after you feel it. You should be able to feel it with your nail. If you can, if the paint is soft, you'll feel your nail digging into the paint. So yeah, yeah just make sure that it's a rock hard finish. Yeah. You can patience. put your tape on yeah. and when you tape, you should tape for that day, if you leave your tape overnight, I do not recommend it. You're gonna end up with residue on there, so tape is a very short term, you know, just think about how many models you can paint that day and just start taping, right. and if you're running out of time, just stop right there. Just go in and spray the rest of the model. But um, 
be sure not to leave tape on a model overnight. And the reason, of course, you didn't do the roof on this is because, well, That's there's a, there's nothing else there, right? Except yes. for the brown that we're gonna use. So after I paint the yellow, I'm going towards this orange band on the bottom. So mm -hmm. I can cover up pretty much everything except for the orange band. Okay. And so that this, that's the next section. I would have to paint this orange and we'll end up with something like this. Okay, so we've got our yellow, we've got our orange, but you know I'm looking at these fine stripes. How do we achieve that? I see you got some of this tape yeah, over here. Yeah, I got all kinds of tape. The tape is manufactured by Chart Pack. Okay. Let's put it right up here, Chart Pack. They make all kinds of different sizes. You can get this stuff at um, mo near most college engineering schools or college campuses, they usually have uh, art supply places and they'll carry that or you can find it online. Yeah, let me see one of those uh, open rolls that you have there of that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, very carefully, yeah, let me I'm move. gonna show how thin. Let me draw, let me put a line down here on the, on oh, the surface. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Yes, excellent. Yes. You see how thin that tape is. It's not uh, cheap either. No, so it, we might it runs around that. like, yeah, don't drop it on seven the floor. Seven dollars, yeah, set around seven dollars a roll. Okay. But you know what? A roll is going to last you for quite some time, especially like here goes. This is you ever wonder how? Sure, right this here. is going to get. <laughs> you try laying down a decal on a model. Yeah. If you pull it, you're going to end up with a straight line. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. Beautiful. And then you'd spray around it and then mm -hmm. remove remove uh, the it. tape yes. itself. Got your knife there, excellent. Yeah, and to the paint, th this tape, you can do some turns with it. So if you had to do, oh yeah. Now you go back to my <laughs> pinstriping days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it comes in different sizes. You can get, uh, I think this is one of the, well, other stores come inch, in huh? to one inch, but it's crepe, it, it has a, a surface on there that will flex. It'll help it uh, move in different directions. You can, and it'll, it will stop, that is great. you know, stuff from, from bleeding underneath, you know? So awesome. you can come up with really clean lines, but since the tape is expensive, I do use other, other tapes. Mm -hmm. like, like this is, this is a lot economical. You can get that one at like, just oh, under three dollars, mm -hmm. yeah, and that one does the same thing. I don't know if it's a if it's. Let me try it out too. Yeah. I I like this tape. I mean, it's really good tape. It, a little harder to turn. It, yeah, it's harder to do you some see of the turns. Lifting just a little bit in yeah. there. Yeah, but it's not like the crepe. The crepe, yeah, you can get some pretty good turns with that. You, uh, I've painted war bonnet stripes. Wow. Using the black tape. Um, Very nice. Yeah, it works really, really nice. But this is a tape that it, it can go on for a short time. You have to get it off. So don't, um, only the don't, day that you're using it, right? Yes, yes, you, yeah. I would not go for a long day, like 10 hours or whatever. I use it on there because it starts to lift up eventually. Right. It starts to, and so when you're ready to paint and you're painting, you're having this starting to pop up. So mm. I, Start painting right away. So short term, short term use, but very, very effective for yes. achieving. Good, we're going to show lines. some of this uh, fine. Look at look how fine those lines are. That's just awesome. All right, so we're going to see it nice and straight. You get make it a little taut, as you yeah, said. Yeah, just pull right? it. Boom. Okay. Yeah, very I tried good. doing that with decals. The decals are just <laughs> oof, yeah. very hard. If you had very to do hard. ten cars, you're doing a whole daylight train, mm -hmm. like all the striping. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's going to just. That's the way to do take it. Yeah, so much faster to do it this way. Even the Union Pacific stripes for Union Pacific cars, I do it the same way. I paint the entire car yellow, uh, then I come in with the red stripes, mm -hmm. then I mask out the red stripes, mask out the yellow, and then I shoot the over car, uh, car gray and peel it all off, and now you got beautiful stripes going all over through the rivets. Very and the nice. rivets, you don't have air bubbles and you don't have, you know, as you would with decals. Very good. Okay, yeah. well, excellent tips for us. We're gonna, in our next segment, we're gonna get into the paint booth and we're gonna see uh, some of the mixtures yeah. uh, that we, you know, put together to be able to go ahead and get this uh, car painted.
We're coming to you from the original Whistle Stop in Pasadena, as we mentioned. And one of the things I love about your store, Fred, is all the brass trains that are around. So I think it's got to be one of the nicest actual hobby shop displays of brass model trains. Do you get a lot of interest from people coming here? Well, I got to say, Dan, thank you for that. Uh, brass, of course, you know, is my passion, but the Whistle Stop has always been known to handle brass trains. I mean, since 1951, we've had brass when it was first introduced. The original owner was a very uh, close friend of Bill Ryan. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he got the, the crowns. Uh, Bill Ryan only sent it to his friends. And yeah. <laughs> Ed got the crowns, and Ed had a select group of people that got to buy the crowns. So it was kind of fun. So I got to see all the crowns as they came in. I started working for Ed in 19... So oh, when was it? It was in... 60, 61, I worked for him on and off. Um, and then when I came back, um, I went to work for a, a bank, but I still continued to work for Ed to fill in for vacations and things like that. When he wanted to take a vacation, he just asked me to come on in and run the store for a week or so. And uh, so that was kind of fun. So, but in the meantime, I got to see all the crowns as they came in and just drool over them and then pass them on to the <laughs> people that got them. But I had the list of where they went. <laughs> ah, very nice. So Ed actually founded the Whistle Stop. Ed Hackenden and his wife Irene founded the Whistle Stop in 1951. Um, basically, he started a little curio shop for Irene, uh, probably to keep him out of her hair or his hair. And uh, she was selling dolls and things like that. But Ed had a passion for trains. So he decided to open up a little corner of the store for his trains. And within a year, it became the Whistle Stop train store instead of Irene's dollhouse. All right. So <laughs> that's how the Whistle Stop was formed in 1951. And I went to work for Ed, like I say, in the early 60s. And uh, just as a part-timer, there's a good crew. But it was just a one-man shop. But Ed had brought in individuals coming to fill in for him on weekends and things like that. The store itself has always been open seven days a week. So that's one of the traditions that I kind of like to keep going. But in 1976, Ed and Irene decided they were going to retire. And being that I was from the bank industry, they asked me if I'd do the first calls. And the first calls are see if people are really interested, if they have the background, if they have the financial funding to buy the business. And so I did the first calls, but the more I kept looking at the business and looking at the calls, I thought, you know what? Why don't I buy the business? Yeah. Why not? So. <laughs> you love trains? You That's already right. worked here? And you know, I, I was getting tired of the banking business. Yeah. <laughs> so it was time to move on, and, and it always was my dream to own my own business anyway. So uh, I went ahead and uh, made the offer, and we had all the arrangements uh, made, and uh, on July 4th, 1976, we we're going to turn the keys over. We picked July 4th because we were closed that day and Ed and I could hassle things out. So I met Ed at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. I walked in the store and that clock was missing. So I said to Ed, I said, hey, where's the number one? And he goes, oh, I'm taking that home. I said, no, ah. no, no, that's not part of the deal. He says, no, I'm taking it home. So I handed him the keys and I said, well, the deal's off. And I walked away. Really? <laughs> I did. And he came, Fred, 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 stop. <laughs> I said, what? I'll put the clock back. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> no, it's, uh, Ed was a, a, a tough guy to deal with, but he was also, you know, he had his ways and I had my way. So we got along very uh, nicely. But uh, so I got the clock <laughs> and I got the store. Yeah. yeah. So that's the story on the clock. So how many employees work here? Because we saw, and by the way, nice staff right. that you had. Thank you, thank you. Right now, we've got a good uh, base of eight employees that work here. Uh, had as many as 13 and 14. But, uh, you know, with all the things going on on the internet world and everything, we've kind of cut back a little bit, but we're all very, very comfortable and can handle the customers. Our job here is service. We can all sell trains, but we take care of our people. We take pride in our service, so. That's what we like to do. So I've got a good staff. They've been with me a, a long, long time. And, um, you know, it, it's really a lot of fun working with them. Also, Fred, I think beyond just the brass, which I love to look at, there's just such a neat charisma about the whole place with the memorabilia. Uh, so is that just things you kind of collected throughout the years? Or? Well, it's kind of interesting. All this memorabilia that you see up above the uh, cases all walk through the front door. Yeah. And it's just 
uh, things that people come in and say, you know, my Uncle Joe found this in the, and I don't know what to do with it, uh, you know, and I'll go ahead and buy it and nail it on the wall. Um, I know on the other side, and I'm sure you'll take a shot of it, there's some original 1923 tail signs for the Southern Pacific. Now, these tail signs were stolen in 1923 by an L.A. police officer. Oh. <laughs> I should say stolen that yeah. he, uh, uh, what's the word we're looking for? He appropriated them. <laughs> Permanently borrowed. But being that he was an L.A. Uh, cop, that he tucked them in his garage, and they s stayed there until he passed away. And his brother-in-law went to clean out the garage and found these uh, glass plates and thought, what are these things? So he started doing some research, found out at that time I owned a company in Chicago that made reproduction plates, um, the tail signs, so Western uh, uh, glass in Chicago. So he called us up and I told him, you know what, uh, why don't you bring them in and I'll praise them for you. And I could not believe these are all original, all the glass. And so I said, well, what do you want to do with them? He says, well, I'd like to donate them. I said, great. So I called a couple of museums up, and all the museums says, oh, no, we don't want those things. We got plenty of them. I said, but you don't know what these are. This is history. This is the second section of the original 1937 daylight. This is all the Overland plates and all the name trains of the Southern Pacific when they first started. Oh, no, we don't want that stuff. Huh. So I, I said to the fellow, I said, well, look, I can't afford to buy these because I already appraised them at eight to ten thousand dollars a piece. I said I can't afford to buy these things, but I said I'll tell you what, I'll start making payments a little bit at a time, and in time, you know, we'll, we'll have the transaction. So I completed the transaction, so I have them nice. on my wall. Very <laughs> so, nice. So you know, there's uh, trophy hunters have sure. you know heads of animals on their wall. <laughs> well, I got heads of. Tail signs on yeah, my wall. Yeah, and we, and we've cool. seen a lot of these uh, <laughs> drum heads, and, and they're beautiful. Many of them, uh, we know you have them lit up, uh, several of them. Uh, yeah. Others just on display, but uh, they're spectacular. Yeah. They are. They're nice to look at. Good history. A lot of people come through these doors. You know, we know they've even, commercials been filmed here, and Storage Wars have been here, and we love the Hollywood scene, but I think most of all what you like is that you've built up some friendships through, you know, people that have come through, haven't you? Well, you're right. Um, you know, we all, they're customers, but they're clients, they're friends. And, uh, you know, I've, I've watched them come in and date and marry, have children, become grandfathers and grandmothers. So that's kind of fun, the fun of uh, owning a, a small business like that, that you develop relationships with your uh, clients, you know, your customers, and they do become friends. I've yeah. been to weddings, I've been to funerals, I've been to anniversaries with all of them. Yeah, that's pretty nice, especially yeah. with the longevity you've had here. Yeah. That's like a permanent fixture, and so we congratulate you <laughs> I'm a that, permanent that. fixture yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard your sign was a, like a historic emblem, but... Well, uh, that's kind of interesting. When we moved, uh, we were located a mile and a half down the street. In 1984, we had decided to move up here where we had parking. So I wanted to move the animation sign. Well, Pasadena had a new law that no animation, no neon, and you couldn't do it. And I wanted this sign up there. So I called the state of California and asked them, how can I get this sign hung? And they said, just declare it a uh, state uh, cultural heritage uh, sign and we will sign that off, get the Pasadena Heritage Foundation to sign off on it, which I did. And so I had to go before the uh, city council and present this to them, where they couldn't deny that I got to hang the sign up. So uh, one of the things is, A, I own it, but I don't own it. <laughs> you know how that goes. And I have to keep it maintained year round. So it has to be on 365 days a year, which doesn't bother me. So, right, right. Yeah, it's just... Uh, it's an iconic sign. Everybody knows the Whistle Stop Neon sign yeah, sure in great. Pasadena. Absolutely. In fact, if you look at the front of my store, I don't even say it's the Whistle Stop. It just says trains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Fred, thanks for having us in. Now hey, we're just going to look around a little right. bit. Hi, this is Richard Pontius from Richmond, California at John McLean's Wonderful Layout. Welcome to Monday Morning Express. Well, Dan, you changed again. This is more changes than a Britney Spears concert. Well, now I'm getting in the mood for the parlor car. Ah, mentioning <laughs> the parlor car, interesting. At the Brass Expo, 
you know, last year we had the roundtable discussion, uh, all of the importers there. By the way, did you know that on the episode of MME that we showed that, over 850,000 views. So we look forward to that this year. <laughs> That's our record. Let's try to beat it. 850,000 views. Yeah, and some of the things uh, that made that episode so popular are going to be back. You can see it live. We are going to have another round table. It's going to be even better. Uh, Seho is going to be back. Several of the importers, uh, hopefully other builders as well. We'll continue to uh, keep you up to date on the Parlor Car event. We'll have live music. Uh, what else can we expect? Yeah, of course, the cash bar you talked about. Uh, uh, some other neat little features that uh, we know you're going to be impressed with that we're going to give out uh, to those who are attending. And I have to say I don't often attend a parlor car event, but when I do, it's at the Brass Expo in Chicago. Wow. We should, hopefully we tape that. <laughs> Very nice. So what can we expect next week? Um, well, we're going to see Boyd again, right? Yep. We got part number five. I believe it is. And this one's really cool because uh, we're going to go over to his paint booth and we're going to see some of the prep work that is involved with uh, everything just before we start uh, priming a model. Again, a few safety features, but ones that are very important for us. We look right. forward to that. And a special treat, we're going to uh, go out to uh, the late Bob DeWitt's home. Some of you may be aware of his phenomenal collection, uh, really one of a kind, the most spectacular mm -hmm. presentation of like passenger car consist and weathered and everything accurate and the room he has them in is just uh, stunning. Not only will we give you a look at that collection, we're gonna chat a little bit with uh, Fred Hill and Jerry Spolma and his uh, wife, uh, Roxanne DeWitt, uh, share some stories about Bob and his passion for collecting. Uh, it's gonna be a treat. You guys are gonna really enjoy that episode. And of course, we're gonna have some more Brass Expo updates on next week's show too. I'll have to see if I can come up with another outfit. But for now, thanks for joining us on Monday Morning Express. <laughs> <laughs>